Uh, I am Bart Thijs, and this is my colleague Maarten Verband. And uh, today we will be presenting to you uh, our paper on robust marker tracking system for vision-based uh, vision autonomous landing of vertical takeoff and landing UAVs. So this is a short overview of our presentation. I'll be giving the introduction and then Maarten will give you all the details. So first, uh, why are we doing this research? I think we can all agree that micro unmanned aerial vehicles are a hot topic and uh, this is because the recent advances in, in uh, technology, um, the components have become cheap and reliable. So uh, this gives an opportunity for many applications. Um, from these micro aerial vehicles, uh, most interesting for autonomous applications are especially the vertical takeoff and landing um, <coughs> vehicles because they do not requi require a runway. They can hover uh, and they are therefore easy to automate. But in order to have a fully autonomous mission, we also need these vehicles to take off and land autonomous. And if we can succeed to do this uh, at a very precise, very precise landing, uh, we can land on a docking station where we can exchange a battery, charge the battery or ex exchange the payload. And um, therefore we can have a fully autonomous mission without the need of a human operator. The focus of this research was to develop an autonomous landing system on, on a docking station based on a marker uh, in order to have an automatic aerial transportation system. Now Mart Martin will continue uh, the presentation with all the details. Yes. Hello everyone. Um, first I would like to start to discuss the actual landing um, because it will give you better insight in the problem um, and you can keep this in mind during the further presentation. So the general idea is that the UAV here on top flies to a destination using its GPS and then when it arrives it goes, uh, it switches to a precision positioning system. And first it aligns itself with the ground station you can see here and then it starts descending. And then when it reaches a height of about 40 centimeter, um, it will stop and go into this state hover. And this is necessary because um, due to wind or certain other effects, um, the positioning error could be too large. And so if the uh, UAV would uh, keep on descending, it will land uh, next to um, its destination, its uh, target. So we would like to avoid that. And so while in this state hover, it tries to maintain this 40 centimeter um, above the ground um, and uh, continuously uh, calculates its expected uh, landing position. And when this falls within the tolerances, it goes into the state dive where it rapidly descends towards the ground station and then goes into the, stand in the state landed. Um, as you can see, the UAV or the quadrotor in this case lands uh, off center with respect to this ground station. And this is because the camera which is used to track this marker is also um, positioned off center. Um, now I will show you a video. So here you can see the state where it's in. So first we, um, we fly on manual and we simulate the GPS. Uh, so now the quadrotor is yeah, flying somewhere in here. And then we will switch to automatic. So now we are in the state align. The quadrotor is now fully automatically positioning itself uh, with, uh, aligned with the, the ground. And now he's going in this descent state. And then when it reaches about 40 centimeters here, so it stops. Now it's calculating where it will land and then he dives. And as you can see, it lands off center and it shuts down its propellers. As you can see, uh, a precision landing requires positioning. So first we looked at some positioning systems and there are three main categories described in literature. The first is a passive optical system and this system consists of a marker on the one hand and then a complex image processing algorithm on the other hand, specifically designed to uh, localize this marker in an image. This requires a high processing power. And then there is the active optical system and this system tries to ease the extraction of the, uh, of the ground station from an image 
by adding active light sources to this ground station. This simplifies image processing, but the solution is less robust since ambient lighting can overwhelm the active sources and then it's impossible to calculate a relative pose. And then there are ultrasound systems. These are completely different and rely on a set of ultrasonic senders and receivers. Then uh, the UAV will end up with a set of relative distances from which the relative pose can be calculated. The calculations are a lot easier, but the setup becomes more complex. Then which of these systems is most suited for landing a UAV? Well, there are three main criteria. First of all, there is the precision and the bandwidth. Um, then it should be robust, since uh, the eventual landing should take place outside. Uh, and then there is the measuring range. Since we fly in using our GPS, the initial positioning error can reach of about 5 meters. So the measuring range should be at least this 5 meters. We can see which of these uh, described systems matches our criteria. Well, a passive optical system satisfies all demands, while an active optical system has a lack of robustness due to the ambient lighting problem. And an ultrasonic system has, in general, a lower measuring range and a lower bandwidth. So the best choice is using a passive optical system. This passive optical system requires first a marker and then a detection algorithm, which I will discuss later on. So this marker is a specific pattern that the algorithm will try to discover in the image. And there are three main requirements for this pattern. First of all, it should indicate a physical spot uh, on the ground. So as you can see, when using concentric circles like this, the physical point is the center of the circle. Secondly, it should be robust. Um, this is done by using, first of all, black and white uh, transitions, which are easily discovered. Um, and then also using uh, a series of concentric circles, they all mark the same center point. So it's more robust than just using one circle. And then it should be fractal. And this is a direct consequence of the quadrilateral landing problem. Um, when the fetal flies in, it has a high altitude and it sees the full marker. But when it starts descending, all of a sudden the marker grows too big and will fall uh, partly um, next to the image. And so still the detection algorithm should be able to detect this uh, marker. Um, in the images I will show you, you will see this marker. And uh, this marker is um, used to uh, give an orientation. So you can see this inverted part here um, will give this marker an orientation. And then there is this other marker. Why didn't we use this one? Well, if you use this one and the VTOL is descending, then the appearance of the marker will not change. Whereas if you use this marker, you will see the circles traveling outside, uh, outwards. And, if you, uh, and you could use this um, to estimate the descending velocity, if you will. Then the detection algorithm or localization algorithm. Um, so this uh, consists of two steps. The first step is a pre-processing step, and it tries to detect all marker edges and the gradients uh, on these edges um, to use them in a second step. What we will do is we have this original grayscale image, and then we will first locally threshold it. So we end up with this binary image. And using this binary image, it's quite straightforward to extract all edges, just scanning for black and white transitions. And you end up with all these red dots here. And then for the gradients, you can easily uh, use some Sobel masks, for example, um, to um, calculate the gradients using this original image. These edges and gradients are then used in the second step, in the localization step. And this is based on the Huff transform for circle detection. Um, this Huff transform for circle detection uh, gives you the center coordinates of a circle and the radius. But since this radius isn't important, um, we adapted this transform going from a 3D to a 2D Huff space. And so speeding up our calculations and lowering this memory requirement. After this have transform, you end up with a so-called accumulation array, which is displayed here. And this can be interpreted as a probability density function. And as you can see, we have here a high peak. And this is just the highest probability um, of our marker center being at this point. And as you can see, it really matches um, the location in the image. If we assume that there's only one marker in each image, and this marker 
gives you the highest peak in this accumulation array, we can use a sort of layered implementation. So iteratively um, improving our estimate of the position. So first you do a coarse estimate indicated uh, here, and so you have this peak. Then you can um, narrow your search and go to this iteration, and you can do this um, on until you have your precision you want. And so this, once again, speeds up our calculation, which is why it's called uh, a fast Huff transform, um, and it also lowers the memory requirements. Then we did some performance testing. So we used four basic images with different marker radii, as two of them are shown here. And then we adapted them to mimic overexposure, um, blur, and shadows, and non-uniform lighting, as you can see here. And then we could draw some results from that. Uh, just some conclusions. Um, first of all, the localization error stays below three pixels. There is only a little effect of non-uniform li non uniform lighting thanks to um, the local thresholding. And then the blur has a stabilizing effect on this localization error. Now we have an algorithm that can localize the marker in the image. But what if there is no, no marker in the image? then the detection algorithm will still try to find one, and so we'd like to detect this case. That's why we made the classification algorithm, which uh, looks if uh, location is consistent with a marker or not. And so we use two dedicated features. The first of them is the separation of subsequent circles, and we compare that with the expected separation. If it matches our expectations, then we can say, well, this will be a marker. If it doesn't, then it's not a marker. Then there's a second feature, and we can look at the amount of circle points. The more points found on a circle, the more um, reason we have to believe that this is in fact a full circle and part of um, our image process, uh, part of our marker. And so we use a linear support vector machine um, to separate these two classes. Some examples. So in the first row, you can see um, some markers which have correctly been localized. As you can see, the blue. Um, is what the algorithm thinks the marker is. And you can see that um, the classification algorithm also says these are markers. Then on the next row, the classification algorithm tells you these are non-marker images. Well, the first two are indeed correctly classified because although there is a marker here and here, it has not been correctly localized. So the location of the detection algorithm is not consistent with the marker. And so these are indeed um, correctly classified as non-marker locations. Then there are these two images, and here are markers which are definitely correctly located, so these are false negatives of our classification algorithm. And then on the last row, there are some, um, some non-marker objects which are round, so the detection algorithm will try to, uh, will tell you that the uh, marker center is the center of this round object, but since they are not markers, the classification algorithm correctly tells you that these are non-marker images. Except for the second here, but as you can see, this clock quite resembles the marker we are trying to detect, so this error is um, expected. Then we implemented um, our algorithm on some hardware. So we used the ArduPilot, uh, which most of you will be familiar with, and we used the Flix PixFlow camera um, to implement our algorithms. So the image processing happens on board of the PixFlow camera since it's equipped with the IRM processor. And so it outputs 25 hertz um, marker position estimates. These 2D image coordinates um, should be um, transformed to 3D world coordinates, and this is called camera calibration. And this is necessary because suppose we have the UAV flying here and looking at the scene like this, and then the attitude changes a bit without changing its position, and the marker will shift in the image. So this requires, it requires compensation, which is done using the camera calibration. Then we used Kalman filtering, since the 2D image coordinates are heavily quantized due to the Huff transform. And so this Kalman filter tries to smooth the estimate, uh, which we will later on use for positioning uh, control. We didn't only um, use the position and the speed of the fatal UAV, but we also added a state of the external disturbance, and this is necessary because this external disturbance will um, influence the behavior of our UAV. 
And so we did an experiment. Um, we used a fan to, um, to cause an external disturbance on our UAV. Um, and then looked at what the quadrotor was estimating. And as you can see, you can see here the force in the y and in the x direction. And you can see the estimate of the force slowly building up to a steady state value of about one newton. Then using this common filter, we were able to do position control. So as you can see, the quadrotor um, maintains its position uh, within a 10 centimeter radius uh, of its target. This position control enables the quadrotor finally to do a precision landing. And so we did four successive landings from which you can see the final pose here. Um, and we have a landing accuracy of at least five centimeters. The orientation um, was calculated um, or was controlled using the prior knowledge of the, um, of the ground station's orientation and the onboard compass and thus it is heavily dependent on the compass calibration. So as you can see, from the fifth to the sixth landing, the compass was recalibrated and all of a sudden the relative orientation changes because there was a calibration error. And this should be avoided in the future. So some conclusions. Well, up till now we're able to um, land indoors. So we have this robust combination of our marker and our detection algorithm. And so we can identify a marker within a three pixel uh, positioning error. Then there is this classification algorithm which we will use to detect uh, whether a marker is present or not. And this was all implemented on the PlixFlow camera yielding a standalone module. And this module is easily transferable from one UAV to another. And so using this module, we were able to make a quadrotor land indoors with a precision of about five centimeters. Now, in the future, we will land outdoors. Um, this um, causes some problems. Um, first of all, there might be reflections on our ground station, and we don't uh, yet understand um, how will this will affect um, our performance. Secondly, the position control um, is not, uh, not good enough to do um, out, uh, outdoor landings because the bandwidth is uh, not high enough. And then, third of all, we will use a marker with orientation as to avoid the compass calibration errors and directly control the relative orientation of the marker, uh, of the UAV with respect to the marker. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention. Now it's time for questions. Yes. Yes, yes. So the question was, did you check um, if, you use, uh, if you could use something like QR codes or something that is already available? That's what you mean. Well, uh, in fact, we did. Um, the problem we are, uh, or that we thought that would be was, if you use a QR code, it can only be recognized if you have the full QR code in your image. Whereas if you land with this UAV, all of a sudden, the QR code will be too big to fit into your image, and so it cannot be detected anymore. And that's why we use this fractal image, and then you can keep on using the same detection algorithm without having to adapt it. Okay. Someone else? Yes? If I'm not mistaken, you use one marker. Yes. Uh, how dependent is, uh, are your results on this really specific shape? So can you make the circles bigger? Yeah, so the question was, how dependent are we on the specific shape of the marker? For example, the, uh, the difference in radii or something like that. Okay. So um, the, the concentric circles just add a lot of robustness. So in fact, you could use just as many circles you want. The algorithm is just looking at any circle it can find. As long as they are concentric, the algorithm will use the information and have a better estimate. Um, we now did an exponential following of the radii, um, and this is to um, keep the marker as lot as uh, consistent when um, going down, so it doesn't really change in appearance. Um, the classification algorithm uses the, um, the ratio of the following um, circles, 
Um, if this changes, then the classification algorithm might give you errors because it expects another follow-up. Um, but the localization step will not bother. So if you adapt this, uh, this ratio of uh, circles, then it doesn't matter for the localization. The classification, it matters. Is that an answer? Yes. Last year in Toulouse, we saw that you, when you want to have a vertical uh, descent, you have to uh, pitch or roll at about 20, 25 degrees uh, with the ah, yeah, at yeah. that moment. Do you expect your system will cope with that? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you're flying outside, then there will be side wind, and so um, the quadrotor will in fact hang in the wind and have a large uh, angle of attack. Yeah? Um, yeah, as long as the, the marker is visible in the image, then this shouldn't be a problem. As long as the, the angles are um, not too large, because if the quadrotor um, has a too large attitude angle, um, then the circles on the ground will appear as ellipses. And so this might cause problems, although the angles have to be very large. So uh, for the detection, not really a problem. Um, but yeah, up till now, landing outside is impossible because the position control um, is not yet uh, so good. Is that an answer? Or? Okay. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what actually happens is um, when you change the um, the amount of shadow or um, overexposure on one half of the image, um, then the the estimates of the position will be influenced a lot. And if you have this blur, um, then the influence of the non-uniformity will be less. So the in fact, the estimates will be more consistent, and so the, the estimation error will be always uh, the same. Whereas if you have a no, no blur, and there is uh, non-uniform lighting, then the estimates can vary a lot. So that's why it has a positive effect. But it's only in that case that if there is non-uniform lighting. Another question? Ah, yeah. Well, now we, um, the, the, the algorithm can process uh, images at 25 hertz. So this is also the frame rate which is being used. Yeah. I think this is a final question for someone, because we have to round up. Ah, yes? What is your first plan to pass the orientation? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, so what's our plan first at orientation or something else? Um. <laughs> so for, for the orientation, we noticed that uh, the compass we have on board um, has results that are uh, quite good if the calibration is good. So uh, for to have a good orientation, we, uh, we are first trying to use the compass. If this doesn't work, we have to uh, rely on the marker to have a, a good alignment at the for the landing. Yeah, I meant uh, to add orientation to the marker because uh, you have concentric circles. Uh, the half transform you can do any shape. Uh, so, I mean, are you just going to take a square? Or ah. you yeah. So <laughs> the question was, um, what will you do to um, implement an orientation with your marker? Um, well, we use this circular huff transform because it has this nice property that you only estimate three parameters, whereas if you use um, squares, for example, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it will be four parameters you're estimating. So the computational, um, the computational power will, uh, that's necessary will increase and the memory requirement will also increase. So. Um, our best guess will be to adapt this marker as I, I have shown you with the inverted part on the marker, um, which allows you to still use this circular huff transform and then use another algorithm, small algorithm, to estimate where this, uh, this inverted part is. Is that an answer? Yeah. Okay.
Uh, thank you for this presentation. I think for further questions, the